Welcome back to the No BS RPG Maker Guide. Today we're going to cover the database. It can be a lengthy topic to cover, and we'll have a lot to unpack. But we will cover the basics today, covering the first half of the database, and in the next video, I'll cover the remaining tabs of the database window. Now, as some of you may be aware, I do have a Patreon if anyone is interested in supporting the ongoing development of these educational videos. All support is appreciated, but it is not required, as I will continue to make these videos as time allows. With all of that said, let's jump into the video and get started. In RPG Maker MV, the database icon is represented by a gear in the top toolbar. Other versions of RPG Maker have it represented with a different icon. So if you're following along with me on an earlier version of RPG Maker, this may require you to adapt some of the information I provide to you today. Let's go ahead and click on the database icon. On your first time viewing this window, you will have the Actors tab selected by default. If you are following along on your own project, please select the Actors tab if you haven't already. The Actors tab is where you will create your entries for player characters. These will be your party members. I will start with some common elements that I want to cover real quick that you will see in each of these tabs. First, the list on the left. Each tab will have a similar list. This is how you will enter new entries into the database. By default, there will be a set number of entries pre-populated, but you can remove or add as many as you find necessary. There is a 9,999 actor limit on this tab, however, so if you need to add more than that, you may need to consider workarounds through creative events. Also, you are probably an insane individual. Secondly, there is the traits section. Here, you can set traits that relate to this character only. In the other tabs, there will be trait sections when applicable. You can set special equipment options and other traits here to help this particular database entry stand out from the rest. Lastly, there's a note section. Here, you can type reminders to yourself regarding that entry. The software will have a few entries notated by default to indicate how it works with the engine. If you come across an entry like that, it is suggested that you leave that entry alone for now until you have more experience with the software and know how to fix a mistake in the event you inadvertently affect the game in a way that you didn't expect. Since we have those bits covered, let's look at the other features of the Actors tab before we move on. Here you will have the ability to name your character and even give them a nickname, which will appear in the in-game menu under Stats by default. Next, you can choose what class the character is, which we will cover momentarily, as well as its initial level and maximum level. The maximum level in RPG Maker MV is 99, although this may be able to be extended with plugins. The description is where you can describe your character to the player. By default, the description will also appear in the status window in game. Of course, you can't create playable characters without assigning their graphics, so here is where you're able to do that as well as let the game know what the starting equipment will be below that. What equipment they can use will be determined by what rules the class follows as well as any traits you may set for the character. Moving on to the class tab, here is where you'll create classes or jobs that the actor can fulfill in game. If you want multiple characters to have the same class, you can set specific global traits for the class where they will be shared between all characters in that class. In addition to the traits, the parameters and experience curve can be manipulated here. The experience curve is simply based on a base value as well as an extra value that is further altered by two acceleration sliders to allow you to manipulate how fast or how slow your character will level up. The parameter curves are an even simpler set of screens. Here you can set values based on the level. You can choose from five quick settings or you can manually enter values. Additionally, if you click generate curve, you can set two endpoint values and tell the engine how fast or how slow you want the character's growth to be. You can do this for each of the parameters that the engine calculates for within the screen. Finally, we have the skills section. Each character should have their own abilities that they start with and slowly begin to learn throughout the course of the game. This is where you can set that. Of course, this is meant for games where skills are learned at different levels. So if you choose to require the player to learn abilities through other methods, you may also leave this area blank. Moving on to the skills tab, this is where you will create new abilities for players 
and enemies to use. This can range from magic abilities or map abilities that can be used to call common events, which we will cover later. You can set the name and a brief description that will let the player know what this ability will do. The MP and TP cost fields are to let the game know how much of your character's resources will be used. MP is the amount of magic points the character has, and TP is essentially action points, which the player can earn through performing abilities and taking damage. The scope lets the game know what kind of targeting will be used, whether the ability is usable on allies, or enemies, or both, and how many enemies or allies it will affect. Occasion will let the game know if you want this ability to be used in battle only, in menus only, or everywhere in the game. From there, we have the Invocation section. Here, you can set the modifiers for how fast the ability will hit, or how slow, which is based on the agility stat of the character using the ability. This will be important in determining the order in which the ability is used every turn. To use an example, you'll want a higher speed for some healing abilities so that in a fight, a heal can be potentially cast before an enemy gets their attack off and wipe the entire party. In addition to the speed, you have the success rate, which will determine the probability that the action will succeed in hitting its target. Repeat is used to determine how many times an ability will hit the target. This can be used to create a barrage type ability that will bombard the enemy or ally with the skill. Next you will see the TP gain. Each ability and item will have a TP gain option. This is to tell the engine how much TP you will earn for using the action. Next we have hit type. Hit type will tell the engine whether it's a magical or physical attack. These two options will calculate the success of the hit based on the target's physical or magical evasion rates. Additionally, we have a third option called Certain Hit. What this will do is make the ability unavoidable. Any successful cast of the spell will count as a hit. Lastly, we have the animation. This is self-explanatory as it tells the engine what animation you would like to play when the spell is used. Moving on, we have the Message section. Here, you can tell the game what phrase you would like to use when casting your ability. You can manually enter the text or use some pre-built defaults with the three buttons below it. Required Weapon is useful for making abilities only usable when you have certain weapons equipped, such as a cane to cast magical abilities or a sword to cast sword abilities. You can specify up to two different weapon types here. Next, we will go over Damage and Effects. These two sections work together to tell the engine what your ability will actually do. You can specify whether this will damage or recover, if it will affect the target's HP or MP, and what elements it will use to help determine the target's resilience to that element. The major thing to note is the formula, variance, and critical hits. The critical hits dropdown will determine if this skill has the ability to critically damage or heal the target. In some cases, you may want to make sure that this is turned off as critical damage can be potentially overpowered. Variance is used to determine a maximum percent that is added or removed from the overall damage calculated by the damage formula, making each attack vary from the last ever so slightly. The effects section will allow you to add or remove buffs and debuffs to the target, or even learn new skills. Finally, let's look at the damage formula. I'm going to break down the damage formula a little for you. Each ability is going to have their own formula that you specify, but we're going to look at the default formula for fire. The formula can be broken down into two parts, A and B. A represents the caster and B represents the target. The formula here has a base value of 100. The formula assumes order of operations by default and will multiply or divide before it will add or subtract. Broken down, this will multiply the A.mat or caster's magical attack by 2 and the B.mdf or the target's magical defense by 2, making the formula appear as you see on the screen. From there, the variance will come into play, giving you the variance based on the value you set. In this case, it's 20%. 20% of 110 is 22, so that means the damage done to the target will range between 88 or 132. 
There is much more that can be done in the formula, and if you're looking to truly master this, I will provide a link in the comments to a thread on the official RPG Maker web forums that discusses the formula and ways to get even more creative with it. The next tab is the Items tab. It is nearly identical to the Skills tab. You can tell the engine if the item is a key item or an ordinary item, and you can specify the price. Even if the item is never purchased in-game, price stat is important. If you set the value to zero, this will tell the engine that the item cannot be sold to a vendor. Otherwise, if you set the value to anything higher than zero, the sell price will be 50% of the price of the item, so keep that in mind when considering the value of an item. Next up, we have the Weapons tab. Here, we can create or edit our weapons with relative ease. The important things to remember are the parameter changes. Always keep in mind the progress in the game that you would like for the player to make when you create your item. Do not attempt to assign arbitrary values based on what just looks cool. Keep in mind what kinds of enemies that players will face, what level the player is, and how the item will be obtained. Consider getting creative with the parameters too. If you have a rogue or thief-like character that makes use of a fast weapon, consider using a sword as a template, but lower the attack value and increase the agility value to allow for the character to strike faster in combat. Don't forget to set the weapon type, price, and animation for the weapon as well. Moving on, we've got the Armors tab. Just like the Weapons tab, you'll see the same exact parameters that you can change. This time, you'll see Equipment Type instead of Animation. This drop-down box will tell the game if this is an accessory, or a shield, or even a piece of armor for the head or the body. Moving on to the Enemies tab, this is where you start to let your imagination really go. In the Enemies tab, you will create your enemy, set its default stats, what rewards you get from killing them, and what items they drop, as well as some minor AI-based details. The first thing I would like to point out is the stats in the general settings. These are going to be static values. Each enemy will maintain these stats throughout the game. So if you want a bat to appear early in the game, but then once again later in the game, you will need to create a separate bat entry for each bat, assuming that you want the one later in the game to be tougher than the initial one. When setting their stats, always keep the damage formula for skills in mind, particularly for the relevant segments of the game they'll be faced in. The rewards section allows you to reward the player for competing in combat with this enemy. It is important to set the value based on factors such as how many of these items you'll typically face in battle and how fast you want the players to be able to purchase items or level up. The drop items section is rather self-explanatory. Here, you can set up to three items that the enemy will drop. These items can be from the items, weapons, or armors database. In addition to choosing what you would like from them to drop, you can set the probability of how they will drop. For some items, you may want them to drop all of the time, which you can simply set by setting the probability to 1. Other cases, you may require the item to drop far less frequently. Determine how rare you'd like for an item to drop, and again, keep in mind how many of these enemies you'll be typically facing in combat, and set your probability based on that. You can always come back and modify the probability if you find your items are dropping too infrequently or too often. Lastly, we have the action patterns. This is where you will specify the abilities the enemies can use, when it is used, and the rating. The rating determines what move is standard, and then chooses other abilities to use depending on the rating value of the others. The standard ability will be the highest rated ability that meets the conditions. From there, it will look for other abilities meeting its conditions and determine their usage frequency. An ability one rating below the standard will be used two thirds of the time, and any ability two rating below the standard will be used one third of the time. The conditions you set can vary based on your creativity. You can make an enemy use a special ability every few turns, when its HP is below a certain percent, or even try to use an ability only if a switch is turned on. Next up we have the Troops tab. In the Troops tab, we will be able to set our encounter patterns up. As an example, let's say you are in a cave of bats. Sometimes you'll fight one or two bats, but maybe you want to fight three bats. You can set all of those variations here. The Troops tab is important for your combat because you won't be able to start combat with your game's enemies without setting your troops, even if the only enemy you face is a single enemy. When you add an enemy or remove an enemy, you can click Auto Name and it will name the troop based on what the enemies are in the group. 
Additionally, if you want to test the enemy placement on the screen in certain environments, you can change the background. Of course, testing battles can be important, so RPG Maker has the ability to test battle from the screen as well. This will be important in determining enemy difficulty as well as how many enemies feels right to have in the battle. In the battle test screen, you can choose what level we want our characters to start at and what equipment they use. They can use the initialize button to reset the character to its initial starting values as well. Additionally, you can choose which actors are used in the battle, even choosing to not bring extra characters in, if you like. Finally, we have the battle event. This works the same as common events and map events, which we will cover in a later video. Here, you can set the conditions and the span for when and how often this event will play out in combat with this troop. This can work real well for giving the player a tutorial in combat in the game, or even allowing for a story to play out during a boss fight. As with events in the map, you can have multiple pages available, so make use of it as much or as little as you like. And with that, we'll conclude the scope of this video for now. There's so much to do in the database window that I'll have to cover the rest in a later video, but this should get you a good start to creating your game. If you have any questions regarding anything covered in this video, please let me know in the comments and I will do my best to help you out. So, for today's homework, I want you to begin creating your first character. You can use custom artwork or even use what comes with RPG Maker by default. I want you to get creative with it, but you can do as little or as much as you want. Come up with a name, backstory, and nickname for your character. Consider adding some special traits your character may have. Maybe create a special class for them to determine their parameters, what abilities they can learn, and what kind of weapons and armor they can use. For bonus points, consider creating a new entry in each of the databases we covered today, including an enemy for your character to face. Share with me your creations as well. You can either reply to the tutorial on RPGMaker.net, or reply to the thread on RPG Maker Web with any screenshots or videos that you make. The links are in the description. Additionally, you can just email me your screenshots or links to your video. I'll include the email in the description as well. As always, if you like this video, please consider subscribing. Likes and dislikes are appreciated. Leave a comment letting me know if this helped you or if there's anything else that you would like for me to cover in a future video that maybe needs more explanation. If you are interested in supporting these videos, consider becoming a background Patreon. When we have enough backers, I will be doing monthly art postcards, so if you'd like to receive a postcard in the mailbox every month, this is something to consider. Also, I stream on Twitch every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so if you want to watch me possibly fail to play video games very well, consider following me on Twitch. Links, as always, are in the description. That said, I hope you have a great day. Stay salty, friends.